Houston, Agrovis, we've got problems on the corner. It's small, has red stripes, five legs. Correction, make that six. What should I do? <laughs> Roger, Houston. All life on Earth is threatened by entropy, the gradual disordering of energy. The energy needed by all organisms to combat entropy is provided by sunlight. Of the visible radiation which strikes the Earth, only a tiny fraction is trapped in plants by the process of photosynthesis. In certain plant cells, carbon dioxide and water, in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll, produce energy storage molecules like glucose. For most of human existence, our ancestors competed fiercely for this stored energy, both with each other... It's mine. No, no, it's mine. Mine, mine. ...and with other organisms on the same trophic level. Oh. Well, then there's still a gopher. Right? It's mine. No, it's mine. At every step in the flow, of the energy from the sun, energy is lost as heat. Because of this, the entire biosphere supported only a small number of humans. Then, beginning approximately 10,000 years ago, there was an agricultural revolution, one which is still carrying on today. This revolution does not increase the amount of energy flowing into an ecosystem, Instead, it depends on the clever recycling of energy within an ecosystem. Just how is this possible? Part of the energy previously wasted by humans is deliberately returned to the plants, along with energy previously wasted by animals. This increased the energy directly and indirectly available from plants. The result has been an enormous growth in human population. This growth has taken place despite the fact that of all the land available to plants, only a small portion is used for agriculture. Just how is this energy recycled? It began with the organization and management of plants in the fields. This returned human physical energy to the plants. It included plant breeding. At its simplest, selecting the strongest and healthiest varieties for replanting. The gradual introduction of primitive machinery made these processes more energy efficient. Pest control recycled more energy. So did irrigation. And in particular, fertilization, putting the unused energy of human and animal wastes back onto the field and into the plant. We can think of these improvements as if they occur entirely within a closed ecosystem into which the sole energy input is sunlight. Today, this agricultural revolution is still with us. Surprisingly, the most efficient use of the recycled energy is in the east, where mechanization is still primitive. In the west, we have taken the revolution a significant step further. But although we actually produce more food, we pay a high price for that food, an energy price. We use chemical fertilizers, elaborate mechanization, and chemical pest control. These improvements have greatly increased the population which can be supported by agriculture. In 1940, an Ontario farmer could feed 15 people. In 1980, 80 people. But these modern improvements require the input of enormous amounts of extra energy into the agricultural ecosystem. This energy subsidy comes from one key source, fossil fuel, converted into gasolines, fertilizers, and pesticides. These energy stocks are limited and the risk of depleting them is becoming a serious concern. 
It's easy to be blinded by the spectacular results of modern agriculture. For example, consider beef production without much fossil fuel energy. For every 12 energy units received by plants, only half a unit makes it into storage as beef. That's for a free range steer. By contrast, a feedlot animal, confined to a yard, hampered by fossil fuel with food delivered to its nose, gains as much as five units of the original 12 of sunlight energy. But this supposed gain in extra sunlight energy is more than offset by the energy cost of fossil fuel added in at all phases of modern agriculture. Not only the energy in fuels, pesticides and fertilizers, but the energy in making them and in making the equipment that uses them. Western agriculture seems to efficiently extract sunlight energy as food, only because we add so much energy in to agriculture. In America in 1940, approximately 125 energy units were consumed per capita from a production energy input of 600 energy units. And our efficiency is actually getting worse. By 1980, food calories had more than doubled, but production energy costs had quadrupled. Part of this drain on our energy resources is necessary, not to supply plants directly with energy, but to make available essential nutrients for the plant's use. Nitrogen, for example, is everywhere in our atmosphere, and it is essential for building proteins. But plants cannot use nitrogen until it has been combined or fixed to other elements. Fixing nitrogen requires a lot of energy. Lightning provides enough to fix some nitrogen in the atmosphere. And in the root nodules of the pea family, bacteria use ATP energy to fix nitrogen. In the past, agriculture has depended on recycling a limited supply of fixed nitrogen. Plants absorb it from the soil and return it to the soil when they die. Since harvesting removes fixed nitrogen from the cycle, it has been essential to return as much of the usable fixed nitrogen as possible in the form of manure. Allowing fields to lie fallow periodically replenishes the fixed nitrogen by natural processes. Today, with fields continuously in production, we depend heavily on the energy of fossil fuels to manufacture fixed nitrogen fertilizers. In spite of this, we aren't keeping up with the drain on soil nutrients. It is estimated that fully half the available fixed nitrogen in the soil of the Canadian prairies has been depleted since the turn of the century. Fossil fuels will be our main method of subsidizing energy flow in agriculture over the next few decades. Protecting this reservoir and stretching its use may well depend on preserving and updating older methods of recycling energy and nutrients within the agricultural ecosystem. Or we may find ourselves back here again. It's mine. No, it's mine. Mine, mine. <laughs>